Still Rain is finally here and there's a mountain of information to learn. To make things simple for you, I made an essential guide with all the main features, without any lore spoilers, of course. Let's get into it. Hello, hello everyone! Welcome back to another Fallout 76 video. The Still Rain DLC is bringing a lot of change to the wasteland, and I know how confusing and overwhelming it can be to tackle it all at once. In order to spare you the trouble and save you some time, I decided to spend some of my own to create this in-depth guide with all the new core features and changes. I can assure you that your Still Rain experience will go much smoothly if you watch everything, because I basically condensed weeks of testing and learning from the public test servers all into one single video. Anyway, I hope you liked the new main menu cinematics rotation, which has been playing all this time, featuring new locations. Well then, we've got a lot to cover, so without any further delays, let's get started, shall we? First things first, Steel Rain will conclude the Brotherhood of Steel Appalachian chapter, be aware of minor spoilers in this point, by the way. Anyhow, if you finish the entire Steel Dawn questline, you should automatically get a new mission the first time you log in after the update. The first Steel Rain mission is a Knight's Penance, and it starts right at Fort Atlas. There are five long missions in total, where some major choices will be forced on you. But don't worry, I won't spoil you there. All I can say is that the obvious will indeed happen. Keep in mind that if no new quest pops up, it's probably because your character is not done with the previous DLC missions. Now, during these new quests, you will get to explore several new locations, revisit existing ones, solve some mysteries, and team up with many different NPCs. As you can imagine, you will be doing all of this while earning new rewards too. Hmm? All in all, the future of the Brotherhood in West Virginia is in your hands, so choose wisely because your story is about to change forever and there will be no going back. Before we enter the legendary territory, let me inform you about Minerva, a new vendor from the Blue Ridge Caravan. She can appear in faction bases such as the Foundation, the Crater and Fort Atlas. In all of them, her spawning point is always near the fast travel spawn for players, so you should spot her right away if she is around because she basically spawns in that area. The problem is, she has a really weird and complicated schedule. She only visits the wasteland a few days per week, or she might not appear at all for one full week. No joke. I could hardly find her during the PTS, which went on for over a month. Even on the correct times, she was not always there, which makes things even more complicated. It's not clear if the schedule logic will be the same as before, but it should be. Anyway, she sells only gold bullion plants, but with some awesome discounts. Her pool is also dynamic, it rotates weekly, data miners already unveiled over a dozen of files showing her different weekly inventories. Here are some examples. Besides the usual gold bullion plans, she also sells daily ops plans, including the so difficult to get weapons and armor plans, like the Brotherhood Covert and Recon armor sets. Well, that will surely be game-changing for many of you. Moreover, she sells everything at a discount, I compared a few plans with Rex prices, as shown here, side by side, and her discount is usually 25% off, or very close to minus 25%. It's not the best discount ever, that's true, but it's pretty decent. Now the challenge is to find her. Oh yeah, that is a true challenge, let me tell you that much. Season 5 Escape from the 42nd Century is live with the Steel Rain DLC as well, with dozens of new unique rewards to unlock. Without going over the entire scoreboard, let me give you the TLDR regarding important entries. First, we have the Fortune Teller Machine at rank 5, an active item which will boost your luck by 2 points for 30 minutes, just like the existing strength and agility boosters we have from previous seasons already. Next, we have the Cardinal Bird Cage, which, in contrary to what I first thought, it's not a remark about CD Projekt Red's logo, it's just a common bird in the West Virginia region, as you guys have been 
commenting in my last video, thanks by the way. It's a very cute addition and a followed first reward. Next, at rank 25, we have the very first power armor display case in grey. Now reworked, as you will see later on in this video. Besides lots of consumables and power armor skins, I feel like season 5 is rich in outfits. It's quite diverse. Such as the Raider Goon at rank 32. Let's not forget about the Mind Paint for the Gatling Laser at rank 36, a very subtle and elegant one. The first season 5 pose is the Jumping the Gab for some more action shots. And at rank 46, you can unlock the Blood Eagle paint for the fixer. It looks badass. It really does. We are also getting new steers with posts, basically platform steers, three versions at rank 50. Now, the Guild of Antiques Foundation is also on the list. It's a very colorful and floral one. And now back to the outfits, at rank 56, you can unlock the Blood Eagle Charmer Blows with heavy rock and punk vibes. Hell yeah! You can also get another version of this outfit at rank 62 called the Blood Eagle Charmer Leather. It looks like the male version to be honest. The Gatling Plasma is getting the Valorous Alistar Paint at rank 66 in silver, copper and light blue colors. At rank 74 you can get your second new pose, the Battle Cry. A roar. Furthermore, Vault Dwellers will now unlock in-game laundry at rank 78, with a new washer and dryer set. Ah, no more dirty underwear, I see. Next, we have the Valorant Sword skin for all one-hand blades. It's a pretty wide skin and it looks pretty decent. Now, Alistar's Chronotron backpack comes at rank 92, such high tech for the wasteland, don't you think so? At least the season 5 beer mug features a dolphin's mind head, so rest assured, high tech is not here to stay. I mean, Alistar's helmet and outfit are also unlockable at rank 96 and 98 respectively, and it highly reminds me of World of Warcraft's Paladins. I don't know, it's just I have that vibe, even though I didn't play the game much, it just screams that to me. You know, gold, bulky and shiny. At rank 99, you can get a red rocket collection, which will have its own scavenge pool with lots of mechanic type of junk, such as tools, buckets, magnets, oil, gas and even fuel tanks, as to be expected, because it's a gas station after all. Anyhow, the Season 5 bundle comes with a very interesting power armor skin, Mine Dolphins are coming to dominate the wasteland, it seems like. I wonder if it has a voice effect? That would be hilarious, by the way. <laughs> Anyhow, these are the highlights for the new scoreboard. Let's keep moving. Okay, now let's become legendary. I mean, if you wish to know basically everything there is to know about the legendary crafting system, make sure to check my in-depth overview in here, because my friends, this system is quite complex and it takes way more than just a few patch notes to describe how it all works. <clears throat> For the sake of this video, let me sum things up, but as the turned legendary effects into a new mod category, this means you can use gear workbenches to turn almost any item into legendary. You can indeed upgrade your gear, but just in terms of stars or tiers. If you have a one star weapon, for example, you can make it two or three stars, but keep in mind it's not possible to keep or save any existing effects. You can also downgrade gear, but I wouldn't know why you want to do that. Anyway, every time you craft, you fully reset all the existing effects. So don't gamble with your great gear in hopes you can make it better, because it doesn't work that way. Moreover, there are several exceptions that cannot be legendary. Named weapons are one, they are already legendary with fixed effects, that's why. Now backpacks, under armor, hazmat suits and all sorts of cosmetics including headwear with effects are not eligible for the legendary status. Boo. Oh well, it is what it is. The same goes for all throwing weapons. To craft or mod items into legendary, you always need legendary modules and cores. The latest is a new item and we will get back there in a little bit. 
What about legendary power armor? Well, it follows the same exact logic. You can basically mod any type of power armor you want and turn it into legendary at any respective station. Everything goes. Seriously, even the new Hellcat and the Strangler Heart sets are no exception here. Now, what you may not know is that Bethesda added new Prevear entries for legendary power armor. It follows the same logic as the existing boxes with 1, 2 and 3 stars. And surprisingly, the power armor boxes are now the most expensive, where one 3 stars box costs 120 scrip. Ouch. Totally worth waiting for the sales for this one, don't you think? Also, something else you might not know is that legendary power armor can now drop from legendary enemies. But due to a plan check bug, the system is only rolling the T45 and Raider sets for enemy drops, despite your learned plans. However, for the mystery pick at the Prevere or from events and daily mission rewards, the pool is considering all your power armor learned plans, with the exception of Strangler Heart, since it would be very unfair. It requires vault currency to craft after all. So yeah, rolling power armor ledges is about to become an everyday thing. Just forget about rolling unwielding though, because Bethesda disabled that for all power armor, it's not going to happen. Well, time to talk about legendary cores, the essential ingredient to craft all these legendaries you want or not. It's another topic that kind of requires a manual because the drop rates are, well, very dynamic to say the least. Let's not forget about the crafting costs. At 3 stars you need 4 modules and 5 cores for weapons and power armor, while normal armor needs one less module. If you consider the Prevere values right now, which is 300 script per day and a module costs 50 script, you can basically buy enough to craft one or two times per day. I know there's also dailies and other events you can get script from, but it's not so easy to get such large amounts of script to buy modules. So you are quite limited to craft per day. That's all I'm trying to say. Now, you can get legendary cores from public events, seasonal events and daily ops too. That's the basic rule. However, if you ask me how many can you get per activity, well, that's when things get tricky. First of all, daily ops are locked at one Elder Run per day. Yes, sadly, you can only loot cores once per day, but only if you finish an Elder. The other two modes will not reward you any cores. Never, ever. Trust me, I learned the hard way. As for the public and seasonal events, it's easier if I show you the Fallout Wiki page that I mined by Gilpo. The link is in the video description below if you want to check it out. So yeah, Bethesda made a drop rate chart for each event where low tier ones can reward you 1 to 3 cores per completion with the respective uh, drop rates. Then we have tier 3 and 4 events with way more core rewards such as Encrypted and a Colossal Problem with 8 each, followed by Project Paradise and Free Range also with 8. Scorch Earth can give you 5 for some strange reason, and Campfire Tales ranges from 2 to 6 cores per event. You may be wondering what sort of criteria is this? Well, supposedly objective tier events should include more cores per event, which is not always the case. I mean, Radiation Rumble, for example, rewards you 1 to 3 cores, kinda like a normal tier 3 for event when it's not. I don't know, it doesn't look like a very transparent or consistent criteria to me. Maybe they are trying to encourage players to do certain events more often than others. That's all I can think of, but these are the drop rates, in case you were wondering. Moving forward, Bethesda introduced some 40 changes to the legendary effects with Still Rain, where 23 are brand new effects. For weapons, the Aristocrats, Gormans and Juggernaut are surely the highlights, with new forms of generating increased and reliable damage. The first one based on high caps, the second based on high hunger and thirst bars, and the last one based on high health. For armor, it's pretty much the same, we also have the Aristocrat for more defense based on high caps, then we have the Overeater with the same effect based on your field hunger and thirst bars, 
Everything else is basically minor effects, most of them are decent, like elemental defense or extra damage to melee attackers. This will surely enable the caps build and the food build, or intensify it, because we already had food builds, but with these effects now, it's a new level of food build, just saying. That's about it for the new effects. Now for the reworks, I think the highlight is definitely mutants with an updated effect where your damage increases based on your mutation number, up to 5 with 25% bonus damage. Assassins got massively boosted from 10% more damage to humans to 50% now. Moreover, the enhanced VATS effect also got buffed from 33% to 50% VAT's increased chance. Other than that, I think the remaining changes are minor and quite irrelevant. I mean, nocturnal is still nocturnal no matter what you do, and specific enemy effects are not great for end game, so let's keep moving. Ay 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 caramba, where should I even start with this one? It has been a challenge to tackle all the changes Bethesda has been doing, with the additions and exceptions to the uh, gear system. It's confusing, so I hope the following details help. Let's begin with power armor. As I mentioned earlier, unyielding is disabled for this type of armor, so you cannot roll it right now. The reason is balance purposes, it would be way too OP to pair this effect with the power armor passives. But wait, there are more exceptions. Acrobats, improved sneaking, divers and reduced limb damage are also out of the equation and that's because these effects are already part of the power armor functionality. You know, no fall damage, breathe underwater, so it would be a waste to have them enabled, they would do the same the power armor does. Ultra revive and weightless are also not possible to roll due to similar reasons as unwielding. What else changed? For instance, the rapid effect can no longer be applied to the Fat Man, M79 and Black Powder weapons. That fire rate was being wasted, so it makes sense too. When it comes to melee, Stalker is no longer an option, but Bethesda added three others regarding VATS. Well, that's decent indeed. Finally, the quad effect is now active for automatic weapons, except the ones using cores. Lastly, black powder weapons can now receive the explosive effect for some extra damage. I might have missed some others, but I think I covered most of it at least. The Hellcat power armor set is being added as a free reward from the last Steel Rain mission, the Catalyst. You receive both the plans and the frame with the respective pieces inside. This new set has been disguised as a T51 model in the public test servers. It was a placeholder model though, but its real appearance is this one. Quite futuristic and modern, very different to what we usually get. In terms of flat defense numbers, this set is not the most impressive. Here's a comparison with some of the most popular sets, such as Strangler Heart, T65, T51 and Ultra Sight, as you can see. The physical defense is very identical to all the other sets. Let's not even go over the energy or radiation defense because these two don't matter much in practical terms. However, the Hellcat comes with a very unique defense. 2% ballistic damage reduction, 16% reduction per set, which is quite considerable. Way more than a few hundreds energy or radiation defense, I would say. It's way more meaningful. Plus, you can now make power armor legendary, so boosting your defense even further shouldn't be much of a problem. Don't forget that this set has all the usual mods sold by faction vendors and regs in exchange for gold bullion. Is this power armor worth it though? Well, surely. First of all, because it's quite easy to get, it's a mission reward after all. Then it comes with some competitive defense and a promising set bonus. I didn't have time to compare it with my Strangler Heart in game, for example, but whenever I played with the Hellcat, it felt pretty much the same. So I believe the realistic defense is not very different from Strangler Heart. So in the end, I think it's all a matter of personal preference, you know? What model do you like the most? That's pretty much it. 
Besides a new power armor set, Bethesda is also adding two new weapons with his DLC. The first one is a named unarmed weapon called Facebreaker. It's part of the new mission rewards. It comes with 40% more attack, one strength and increased damage with every hit on the same target. It's a pretty okay weapon. I won't say it's one of the best, but it's also not one of the worst, not even close. I would call it a beginner's or emergency type of weapon. It can kill, yes, but it does take its time, especially with super mutants and anything stronger. At least the second new weapon is much, much more powerful. It's called the Pepper Shaker and it's an upcoming reward for Meat Week, a seasonal event going live in August. Anyway, and first of all, this weapon cannot be rolled as explosive, but as they removed it mid-testing, I know, bad news, but I'm just a messenger, okay? Now, I had the chance to test a bit with a two-shot and a quad pepper shaker. Nothing too impressive, I know, but the weapon has potential. I mean, the overall damage was relatively low outside of fads, but with focused hits, yeah, that's the deal. It destroys targets very easily. The big con here is that the hit range is huge. It sort of creates a beam, so it's normal to miss a lot, I guess. Unless you build around it, you know, with the power armor, with the respective mods, with some eight items, foods, and then it's perfect. But without all of these things, I think it's a bit lacking in that regard. Moreover, this is a heavy shotgun and can benefit from both categories. Yes, that means more damage than most weapons because you can benefit from both heavy perks and shotgun perks. Plus, the enforcer perk also works like a charm, which turns the shaker into a cripple machine. Just look at that. All the mutants walking as slow as snails because they were crippled, of course. Now, this happens because the shaker eats bullets, literally. So your cripple chance is much, much superior than with a normal shotgun. I can totally imagine this gun becoming part of the endgame weapon list, but only time will tell. We are getting new gear, but that's not everything. No, no, no. But as that also added a series of new free items with Steel Rain, as I already covered in my other video here in great detail, feel free to check it out. There are three duck decoys, a plastic fruit ball, a plastic fruit rat, kitchen decor, anyone? Kidding, it fits almost anywhere, but I still think they are for the kitchen. There's even a Wastelander cooking station made with a shopping cart and half a bicycle. Pretty hilarious. No, it's it's a genius idea. I, I said it before and I'm saying it again. Too bad Meat Week is only happening in August, so we have over a month to wait for a chance to farm such new exciting rewards. Anyway, let's not forget about the free rewards from the new missions such as two new outfits, the Mercenary and the Brotherhood CVs, as well as a black bungalow, which is basically a repaint of the existing green ones. But if you don't have one yet, then here's your chance to get your bungalow. One of the most important changes with this update is the currency increase. That's right, Bethesda decided to increase the values, but not all in the same way. For instance, the cap's daily limit remains the same, 1,200, but the stored cap increased from 30k to 40k per character. That's decent. The daily limit went from 150 to 300, and the max you can store per character is no longer 1,000, the new value is 5,000. Yeah, what a buff there. Something similar happened to Gold Bullion, where the daily limit went from 200 to 400, and the max per character is now 10k instead of just 5k. Well, it's definitely a start. These daily limits have been too low for too long. So it's refreshing to see Bethesda listening to the community feedback. Next, we have an item that many of you have been waiting for a very long time. Yep, Bethesda is finally releasing one of the power armor display cases through Season 5, now with a reworked model. Before, we had a station and a buildable frame, then we had to equip each piece to the frame, which would then consume hundreds of budget. But now, the display accepts frames only, which means any power armor set you add for display will only weigh 10 pounds each, and that's it. I love it how they also listen to the feedback on this one. 
Amazing, they should do it more often. The max per camp and shelter is still 5 by the way, and sadly there is a small new issue with the display lights. Sometimes despite being connected to a generator, the lights will not turn on or might turn off on your next visit. It's a very strange bug, but at least it's not game breaking, it's only visual, so at least that. Alright everyone, this point was supposed to come only in another video, but since this is so important I just had to reconsider. I mean, we are talking about one of the most popular power armor sets in game, which has been bugged for ages, but with still rain, the Strangler Heart has regained its powers and it's now dealing poison damage correctly. No joke, I couldn't believe it when I first tested and found out it's fixed. For those not familiar with the issue, before Steel Rain and for a long while, this power armor set passive was buggy. The poison cloud would show on nearby enemies, but it would not apply any damage as it's supposed to do. But as you can see, it's working pretty well once again. I tested in several enemies and as you can clearly see, the damage over time is applying. They are even dying when they are weak. Uh, like ghouls and scorched. Well, sometimes it's difficult to realize if it's working, but it depends a lot on the enemy, on the HP, on the defenses and so on. For example, in this Yagwai, it looks like it's not working, but if you pay close attention, the HP is slowly going down. It's because he's a big boy and he has a lot of HP. Well, everyone, enjoy your old new Strangler Heart set. To finish off, I have another change that is not exactly major by its own, but I feel like it matters in the sense that it can be a farming item now. Let me explain. Floater grenades are now tradable, which means you can drop, trade and sell them. They sell really good too, 8 caps per grenade at 18 charisma without a hard bargain equipped. That's basically more than any other grenade or mine. Now, if you do public events, these grenades drop all the time, which is ideal for farming and getting caps in return. But we are also used to drop the floater grenades because they weigh you down, that I'm afraid people will just disregard this or forget this. That's why I decided to add this as the last point. I think there's potential here because why should you drop it? You know, you can just sell it now instead of junk or scrap or something else. So do it. It's a new strategy and sometimes a little different doesn't hurt. That's pretty much a summary of Still Rain, at least in terms of new content and major changes. Believe it or not, despite the walls of text in the patch notes, most of it consists of minor changes, small fixes and or improvements nobody can test. Not at all. There's still the bug and fixes part, I know, but I will obviously address that in another video. Well, I wish you all a lovely adventure and I hope I could improve your Steel Rain experience one way or another with lots of knowledge. Alright then, thank you for watching, I am Marty Branco, feel free to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this, and as usual, a huge thanks to all my dear supporters, you guys make the difference for me, that's for sure. Well, I hope you're having a good one, I will see you all very very soon in the next video, until then, take care, adios, bye bye!